right. All right, all right, all right. How y'all feel? Good to hear. Okay, um, I got a question for you guys. Do you ever get caught up in like a situation where you're like, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do right here? Like, for example, like your wife or your husband is like super frustrated with their boss at work, right? They had some kind of interaction and they got really upset with them. And you can see that the boss was wrong, but your spouse is kind of wrong too. You don't know how to side with them, but also like point out like, hey, uh, you got a part to play in the situation. Anybody been like some kind of, you don't know what to do in that situation, okay. Or maybe you, you've done something and something blew up on you. Like you got into a discussion with a friend, everything was going cool. You know, you mentioned one word or one idea and then all of a sudden, y'all got into this big argument and you just don't know how you even started arguing with that person and then you haven't talked for like months after that. Anybody ever got into a situation like that? Like just something happened and you wish, man, how could I go back and fix that situation? So the only six people here got into arguments before? The rest of y'all have been saved your whole life, I see. Since birth. Came out the womb praising the Lord. Amen. The thing is, what we're going to do in order to help with that is a how-to series. So we're going to go on a, a long, Chris talked about it a couple weeks ago, a how-to series, which is how to handle certain situations in your life. Um, because the hardest part of a Christian walk, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the hardest part of a Christian walk, as I've experienced it, is application. It's easy to read the word, it's easy to understand the word, but applying it to your life is oftentimes challenging, and we're going to teach on that for, for a while. We're going to have uh, some topics that we're going to come up with, how to go with the, how to be fearless and not succumb to fear, how to uh, reconcile a broken relationship, how to discipline your kids. There'll be all sorts of how-tos, and even if there's some ones that we don't cover and you want us to address, um, you can submit them to us and we can prepare some how-tos on that. And we want you to be able to take different challenges that occur in your life and start to refer to the Bible in terms of how to deal with them. Yeah. Not just how you feel, not just your opinion, but the word and how to deal with them. And because if enough of us do that, enough of us do that, we can start to encourage the other people who don't to do that same thing in their life. And in that way, sharpening one another, develop the ability to perform and operate according to the word. Um, it says in 2 Timothy three sixteen that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is full and complete with direction for how to deal with any situation and area in your life. And since that's the case, we're going to try to help plan and, and talk about how to apply some certain situations. But, and the thing we think about is if you study ahead of time, either the situation that you're confused by will go easier, or as you look back, you'll be able to study, man, how could I have potentially done that, de done that better? Now, we're not going to get into every single topic. We're eventually going to get out the how-to series. We're not going to address every area, every part of your life. But the idea is that if we go through enough of these topics... At some point, you'll start to see and apply that, those principles of how do I apply the word? How do I look into the Bible and apply it to my life to deal with certain issues that are going on? So you'll start to believe in 2 Timothy 3, that it's true, that the word is full of direction for you. you also start to trust God more for direction in your life instead of trusting yourself. I don't know about you guys, but trusting myself has uh, got me jacked up once or twice or 100,000 times this year. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of where we're going with that. Now, we're going to start off, though, uh, the first how-to is how to build a strong foundation. Okay? And we're going to come back here often um, as, as the anchor. Okay? We're going to come back here often as the anchor to the Christian faith. Because oftentimes... You can get stuck in thinking that this how-to stuff, is, it, can, it can get you caught up in different ways. Uh, what we're going to talk about in those times is, is justification. This is, that's what I'm talking about today, okay, justification. Then the next week we're going to talk about sanctification. And then on Easter Sunday, uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and how Christ, when he died, he rose again, and he said he'd leave behind a what? A helper, a comforter. Someone to walk alongside of us in the Holy Spirit to guide us through in this process of how do we do all these different things. But the reason why we're starting with this foundational piece, building a strong foundation, is for legalism and idolatry avoidance. Now, legalism is basically the, the dictionary, and I got this, uh, oh, I got this awesome 
Like, I was studying, I don't know about y'all, man, but sometimes studying the Bible is exciting. And for me, I mean, last night, man, I got this, I'm a nerd too, right? So I got this software yesterday from the, you know, this dude sold me this expensive software that I found out that we can get for free. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can, I mean, it just, it just, like, whenever you're able to take different, different um, tools and kind of bring more understanding to the word, it's just, I don't know, it's a beautiful thing to me. Let me get back to what I'm talking about here. Okay, so legalism, the definition of it is a strict or literal or excessive conformity to the law or religious moral code. Okay, so you're excessively following the rules. You can follow the rules too much, so much so that, uh, that it becomes a big problem. If you turn to Romans 3, 19, uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Romans today. Uh, Romans 3.19 that says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. So, the law is not intended for you to become, to make you righteous. That's what the, the Jewish uh, people thought it was for, and, and, and we're trying to turn that definite thing around. The other side of it is idolatry. Idolatry is an excessive attachment or devotion to something. Okay? Um, and just think, okay, just think about that. An excessive attachment or devotion to something. That's anything. It could be card games. It could be, you know, the Xbox 360 Connect. Is it Xbox I want to connect? You could be, ex- no, I ain't going to tell you to stop playing your Xbox, man. Don't be all, I know some of y'all just got concerned. But I'm saying there's things that sometimes you worship above God. And you can see in Romans 1, verse 25, that, um, it says there that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised. Amen. So sometimes people can even worship religion. You can idolize religion. You can start to think that because of the way you dress moderately or because of how hard you pray or how often you read your Bible, that God thinks that you're righteous. So much so that you don't hear God saying, put down the Bible and talk to your brother or sister right next to you. So we're trying, we're starting with a strong foundation because we want to avoid uh, getting caught up in a situation with idolatry or legalism. Y'all with me? Okay, beautiful. So this is going to be the anchor. Throughout the whole series, we'll return back to this. Now, don't get it twisted. (laughs) Does it say that on there? Okay. Don't get it twisted. Okay? I'm going to tell you what you shouldn't get twisted. Justification, regeneration, sanctification. Remember, next week we're going to talk about uh, sanctification. We're not going to do a sermon on regeneration. It's kind of regeneration, uh, we'll talk about it right now. So here's the difference. I want you to get these twisted. You've got to keep these things separate. And that word is dikaio. Dikaio. Okay? Y'all wanted some Bible study, baby. Some people in the group said we want to study the Bible. Well, here it is. <laughs> Dikaio, look in verse 20. In verse 20. But in the Bible, it has a range of meanings. In, uh, the, in Romans 3.24, where it says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That is um, a justific- uh, declared righteous before God. So God is saying, I see your sinful, nasty, wicked bodies. That's how you're born. That's how you're made. But I'm looking at you as though you're as pure as I am. Justify. That's, the, that's one way that justified is, talk, is mentioned. It's also mentioned in another way to, call, uh, or to say to show yourself to be righteous or to look right in front of people or in a legal sense or to be acquitted. Like in James, turn to James uh, chapter 2.
the, the point here is I want you to walk away when you read different uh, parts of the Bible where it uses this term that you don't get them mixed up either. In James chapter 2, verse 24, it says, in NIV it says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. But in the King James or the ESV or other translations, you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. Okay? It's that same word, dikaio, justified. So it's not saying in the same way that you're justified before God. It's just saying that you're made to look right in front of people. Another good way to look at it is turn to Luke. Turn back to Luke. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, Luke chapter 16. I'm just trying to break down here that there's a difference in the way that the Bible even talks about the word justified. So you don't get those two things mixed up. So in Luke 16, verse 13, it says, uh, this is Jesus talking to uh, the Pharisees, that no one can serve two masters. Either you hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who do what? Justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So, when he talks to the Pharisees, he's saying, you're the one who do what? You justify yourselves in the eyes of others. So you see he's not talking about you make yourselves right in front of God, in front of others. No, he's just talking about you make yourself look good. Like you make yourself look like an upstanding person. It's kind of like if you turn to like a project, like if you have a project in school, you turn a paper in, a project in late, or you're at work, and you have like a work assignment. And your boss tells you, oh, make it to us by Friday, and you don't turn it in until next Tuesday. Or, you know, like, you turn to him and you say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I was volunteering at the soup kitchen all last week, boss. Because you're trying to make yourself look good, even though you jack some stuff up. That's this justification that we're talking about here in James and in Luke. So there's a range of meanings when you see it. I don't just think every time you say it. And that's also because some people will tell you that, that verse in James that said you see that a person is justified by their works. That's how people do a lot of things to say, let's go out and, um, uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, let's go out and go witnessing two by two because they're, they feel like they're justified or made right in front of God by going out and witnessing and overlook the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Do you feel what I'm saying? What all this is saying is you just look good in front of people. Okay? Now check this out. How and why are we justified? Right? God is saying, okay, to you. I like you. You're pure. You're clean. It's the imputed righteousness from Christ. How many of y'all, this is the first day you've heard the word imputed? Okay, good. We're going to learn something today. Imputed means to credit or assign a charge to a person with the quality because of the conduct of another. So that's saying, you're saying one person, you look at that one person and say, because of this person, I think you look that way. It's when God says, he thinks of one person when he thinks of another. So I'm, I look at you, but I look at you like this person. So for example, he looks at the Christian like you're righteous because of Christ. So the, the, the qualities, the righteousness of Christ is imputed Take it from him and put on us, each of us as believers. But here's a little catch. There's been imputation. I just conjugated that imputed three times in the history of the world. I just told you about one from Christ to us. Anybody know what the other two imputations were? For a free Lyricist Lounge 4 DVD, who knows other two imputations? History of time. Come on, just, just try. I ain't, ain't going to buzz you, you know, dump a little gack on you like this is, you know, them TV shows. I ain't going to pour the... Okay, when? Uh, no. <laughs> but that's a good guess. I was going to say maybe um, the children of Israel's sins onto maybe a little more goat. No. But good, good guess. I heard somebody over here say it. David, because Solomon died. No. Solomon was the first. No. <laughs> Amster. That's one. So Adam's sin was imputed to who? All of us. So what, what about what was number two time that the imputation happened? This one's tricky. Yeah. This is tricky. It's, it's, it's going to be obvious once I tell you. The second Adam. What happened with the second Adam? 
temptation into Mary to have Jesus to make us pray. No, that's conception. <laughs> Incarnation, <laughs> not imputation. But close. But very, very close. Oh, that's beautiful. Give it up one time for Barack Obama. So yes, the sin from Adam was imputed to all of us, and that's a free illiterate last for DVD for Brandon and for Amy, but she keeps them all at her place anyway, so she's gonna get one for free. Or whoever who said that actually? She can impute it to me. And she can impute the DVD to you, okay? Not exactly, that's not a right use of the word, but she can give it to you. So uh, the sin from Adam was imputed to all of us. The sin from us was imputed to Christ, right? And then the sin from Christ, what? She's saying you're okay, just like the last, no? Okay. She's trying to keep you all awake with the imputation. Okay, so the sin from Christ was imputed to us, or the righteousness, rather, from Christ was imputed to us. Y'all with me? Y'all got imputed. So you see this righteousness we have, it did not come from us. It did not come from us. And how about this? Christ's punishment that he deserved didn't come from him. That did come from us. Uh, a quote from Alistair McGrath. This gentleman is a, a professor of historical theology at the University of Oxford. He says that believers are treated as if the righteousness of Christ was theirs through faith. It is on the basis of this alien righteousness, right? So this righteousness from the outside of us that God accepts us as humans. It's only because of Christ's righteousness that we're accepted by God. Here's another kind of way to think about imputed righteousness or th th thing to think about. Nothing in us changes. Because Christ's righteousness comes on you doesn't make you any more righteous. Just his righteousness is credited to our account. I have a, you guys know who that picture is on the screen? Who is it? So Bill Gates. Imagine you're going in to get a loan at the bank, right? You know, some of y'all may have had some credit issues in the past. You know, okay, maybe it's just me. And you go apply for a little card, and the dude's like, sorry, denied, just stamped, no. He's like, but wait, I got somebody that's going to call you for a reference, and Bill Gates calls and says, hey, man, this is Bill Gates, you know, go ahead and give Chris that, uh, that uh, approval of the loan. Because if he don't pay, he's a good guy, he'll pay, but if he don't pay, I'll pay. They'll give you whatever kind of money you want, because Bill Gates has $61 billion in the bank. Y'all feel what I'm saying? Christ has an eternal amount of, uh, of righteousness with which to draw on. So when we stand in front of the Father and you try to come on your own account, denied. Your credit score is negative. But when Christ is there on your behalf and he represents you and his righteousness is imputed to you, then that's whenever God looks at you as righteous, not because of yourself. He declares us righteous in his eyes. Okay? If the sin don't fit, you must have quit. Okay? When God declares us righteous, there's forgiveness of sin. Total forgiveness. No penalties for sin. Past, present, or future. Check out on Romans. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 4. Y'all know the brother got free. Am I the only one that was there when the trial went on? Okay. He was justified, you know, by a corrupt legal system, but God's justification is pure. Romans 4. If you're not there yet, say, hold on. Okay. Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Okay, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from their works. Blessed are those whose transitions, transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Now this is a reference back to Psalm 31 that David wrote. So this is a quote. This is a, uh, Paul is quoting Psalm 31. He's quoting David in Psalm 31 when he quotes this piece of scripture. In verse 7 and 8. And don't turn there right now, but in Psalm 103, David also says, As far as, as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God has forgotten about our sins in a way that we certainly can't do, but in a way that's complete. 
And it's not, but here's another thing. People say that this, uh, these concepts are newly made concepts in Christianity, like we just invented them with the Nicene Council. But David was talking about this before Christ even came. God is a forgiving God and has been for all time. So this is not a new concept. Now the, the reality is there still may be consequences of sin. Okay? Like if you had sex outside of marriage and you have a, you're raising a child as a single parent, um, it's a lot more difficult to do that than it is if you had waited until you maybe were more mature and could have finished school and gotten married. Um, and so it's not a curse, it's just a consequence of the sin that you committed. Or if you committed some sort of crime, like if you uh, stole something, a lot of money, or if you uh, committed some type of assault, you, God will forgive you of your sin, but you still may have to suffer the consequences like going to jail or, or maybe have a harder time getting a job someplace or whatever the case may be. So just because your sin is forgiven and you, you have difficulties in life, it's not God punishing you. There still are consequences for your sin. Does that make sense? And at the same time, God may still discipline us. It's like a spiritual whooping. You know? You get, you drunk, you get drunk, and maybe you end up getting a DUI, your license gets taken away, and everything else. And some other people may get drunk, right? And they go home free, and nothing ever happens to them. But, but if you get drunk, get a DUI, that's God is in control. So he's like, listen, man, if I don't do something to you, you're going to destroy yourself. Or if you've already given your life to him and that sin is preventing you from becoming more like Christ, he'll discipline you to direct you back to himself and to Christ's likeness. So discipline does not mean that, that God has not still justified you, that you're not still in right standing before him. So don't look at difficult times and think, man, you know, God is paying me back for the sin that I committed. No. God may just be correcting you where you need to be corrected. So how are we justified? It's set it up in Romans. Turn back to that uh, Romans 3. How are we justified? And I'll give you a clue. It's in verse 28. By what? By what? By faith. Yes, by faith. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I thought it was nice. Faith. People get a lot of things twisted whenever they lose track of, of their justification. Whenever they think, whenever you start to think um, you're justified, or, or you, um, so justified means you, you, what? you look right, you're made righteous, declared righteous in front of God. If you think you're justified by your works, you'll work yourself to death. You'll be mad, you'll be in bondage over trying to do service to people. Oh, I, I, I help with the kids' ministry, and I, I, I go out and witness to people on, on Saturdays, and I, I read my Bible so much. But you lose sight of God because you forget that your justification doesn't come by works, it comes by faith. It comes by faith. So check this out. You ever, anybody ever heard this term, sola fide? Yeah. By faith alone. Now, okay, this is the part where, like, if you, if you have a real heartburn about reform theology versus Arminianism versus, I don't know what the five points of a tulip even are, okay? But the reformers, they existed, and the reformers existed to kind of turn away from a certain type of way that Christianity is being practiced that was wrong, that robbed Christ of his righteousness. And if you hear some terms that I say right now, and it tickles your ear, because like, man, is that reformed? Is it not? It's just the Bible, okay? It's just the Bible. So there's only like two or three people that's going to affect, but those people need it, or they won't be able to hear anything else that I got to say. Check out um, Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Verse 2. It says that if, in fact, Abraham was justified by what? Works. He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as what? He did what to God? He did what to God? Believe. believe. Faith is to believe, to cling to, to adhere to. And God counted his faith as righteousness. There's a reason, as I was studying about justification, there, there's all kinds of ways that God could have said in, in terms of the emotions that we have that we could have demonstrated um, that we believe in him. It could have been like, we love more. That shows that we really, that's how we demonstrate our, our faith in him or, or, or our justification. It could have been that we, all kinds of different things. But you know why faith is used? 
Why faith is used is because it's the opposite of depending on yourself. The 180 degree opposite. You ain't got no part to play. It takes total faith to understand and believe that it wasn't you that did anything to get where you are. In front of God's eyes. Now with the reformers, you may have heard of Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers. They separated from the Catholic Church back in the 1500s. And the reason why is because there was this, there was this um, the, the Catholic Church had this belief that there was this big treasury, you know, like a big bank account, if you will. Okay? And then this bank account was called the Treasury of Merit. Y'all know how the bank account with the Treasury of Merit got filled up? Because of Christ's sacrifice, but then all the good deeds that the early church fathers did. So they did all these good deeds... And then the treasury of merit filled up. Y'all with me? Yeah. So then the way that you got to be right before God was by, by, by getting indulgences. Indulgences were like ways that said, oh, okay, you can borrow from that bank of tre that treasury with something called an indulgence. And then you would look more right before God. And how did you get indulgences? We well, indul got indulgences by doing good deeds. You got indulgences by saying the stations of the cross, like you see those people with the rosary beads saying the Hail Marys or whatnot. That's how you got right in front of God, by all these works, or you could buy the indulgences. The reason why, one of the ways that Martin Luther started to reform against the church is because there were people coming around saying, hey, buy some indulgences. We're building a new church. Buy some indulgences, and that'll make you look right in front of God. And people believed that. They're like, we don't know how to get to God. Only the priests know. Not us regular, not little old us. Only TQ knows how to get to God. So we got to come to TQ, and he'll email us some, some righteousness, right? I'll text you some righteousness, 99 cents per text, and then you look good in front of God. Does that make sense? But that's what everyone in Christendom believed. And the, the reformers came along and said, that's crazy. It's faith alone that gets you there. Me and you have a direct connection towards God through... Through faith in, in Christ. And they tore those beliefs down and it, it upset the church. Martin Luther got excommunicated. People got killed all over saying you, had, you, could see the, you could see Christ. You could be righteous in front of God without having to pay somebody for it. Or without having to do some certain good deeds. But do you see, now we think, man, that's crazy. Why would, who, who would buy righteousness? But how many of you... How many of you, whenever you're really upset, you say, hello, brother, how are you? But in your heart, you hate that person. And you think by looking nice, that God will think that you're righteous. Even though in your heart, you don't feel any love towards that person whatsoever. Or even like this, like you serve. You come in here and you, um, I know the sound team is all, I know they all have the strongest faith in the church. You know, they serve wholeheartedly. But let's pretend for a minute that you were on a sound team and you set up all this equipment and stuff, but you hated doing it. Every time you came, you don't know why you woke up in the morning, you were mumbling and grumbling all the way along, man, it's cold outside, I hope it don't rain today. Now, how come the speakers got to be on all the time? The TV's always telling me, turn the volume up, turn the volume down, turn it up, turn it down, turn the lights on, turn the lights off. You aren't doing the service for the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, you're doing it because you feel obligated to. Because you think God will think you're cool by doing that service. Anybody besides me been there before? Where you're serving God, not out of a right heart, but you're serving it out of a, a, a way to look good in front of them. You were buying your own indulgences right there. By your service. And so what the reformers came on to do, what I'm trying to tell you today, is you're not justified by the works that you do. You're justified by your faith. And what, is, what does uh, faith look like? Faith has three parts. Knowledge, assent, and personal trust. Okay? Knowledge, assent, and personal trust. So, knowledge is just you know. You know, intellectually, that Christ, and this is, I, I totally borrowed this from a brother yesterday. I was at the, uh, I, I was, it's crazy because I was, I'm putting the sermon together on justification, and then yesterday when I went to the, I, I went to the Legacy Conference, Shia Lin was there preaching, and his topic was justification. I was like, man, the Lord must really want justification word to get out this weekend. But I borrowed this from him, and he talked about the, the parts in faith um, are happy parts. Knowledge, assent, and personal trust. So knowledge is this. You know. You know that Christ died. He was atonement. He was a sacrifice for my sin. Kind of like, um, I don't know if it was uh, LaAsia or Amy that said back in the old days, they would have a lamb. The Jews would bring a lamb that was pure. Does that sound familiar? 
the priests put their hands on the lamb and passed the sins of the tribe onto that lamb. Then they would carry that lamb out into the middle of nowhere, cut a throat and kill it. And by that way, they, that's how they made the sacrifices to God. He told them to do that, so that's what they did. So it was right for them at that time. So y'all, what was Christ for us? The lamb who was slain. So you just know that Christ was a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Our, our righteousness, our, our sin was what to him? Was what? Was imputed to him. Was what? Come on, y'all. Say it like you mean it. It was imputed. Pew. It was our sin. Our, our, our sin was imputed to him. He was sacrificed. So you just know that. And when he was sacrificed, died, rose again, then he became, uh, uh, his righteousness was, uh, was then imputed to us. So you know it. That's knowledge. Then it's assent. Assent just means that you agree that it's true. Right? You just agree that, hey, that like, not that I just know that it's true, but I, I verbally, I agree. Like, because some people who are um, uh, Jews, people who are Muslims, people who are other, all other faiths, they know that Christ died on the cross. They know that the facts, that that's how salvation is achieved, but they don't agree with that to be true. And the last thing is personal trust. So you trust in it to be true. Let me ask you guys a question. If I said I trusted Chris to catch me if I fell off the stage, you know? Or let's say y'all was up here, like I was like forgiving like some hot rapper, you know? And, and, and y'all was all up here at the front of the stage and you was just screaming and carrying on crazy because of my tight rhymes and lyrics and bumping beats if I said that I that I personally trusted you to catch me would you believe me if I didn't jump I, I trust you though I trust you would you believe me if I didn't jump why because there's no action that follows true faith that personal trust produces action so, so here's where some of those, the, 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 here's where some of that study that we talked about earlier is going to come into play. Let's turn back to James chapter 2. Because whenever you trust in God, so if, I t if I'm an artist that's been all this time performing and I never jump off the stage and I tell you now I trust you, for you to believe me, you've got to see a change in my life. There has to be a change in your life as a Christian as compared to B.C., as compared to before Christ. There has to be some kind of a difference. And James talks to us about that. In chapter 2 of James, if you're not there, say, hold on. Okay. I think most of us are like we're there. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by what? Action, Action is what? Yes. So if the faith by itself is not accompanied by, it is? Yes. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, or you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and, he's, and he justified us through his sacrifice. Good! Even the demons believe that. That doesn't make you any better than a demon at this point. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Whoa, TQ, you said Abraham's belief counts him as, but then he's considered righteous for what he did. Is anybody confused? A little bit? No? Yes? Okay, check me out. It's saying here that he was considered what? Considered righteous or declared righteous, which also means. Justified, because I think in some translations that part right there says justified. So is this justification in front of God? Is this right standing before God because of what he did? Is this right standing in front of God because of what he did? It's because of his, his faith. That's why I told you before that there's a range of meanings for this justification. 
There's a range of meanings for, 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 for being declared right by what you do. You remember when we talked about that before? You see how you can get confused? If you say, wait a minute, it's what he did, but before he said it's about what he believes, well, it's not, he's not considered righteous like God. It's not, I'm cool with you, Abraham, because of what you did. No, he's honoring Abraham's faith, and his faith produced what? Action. And the action was he was ready to sacrifice his only son on an altar. That's what the, that's what the word means when a faith without works is dead. How about this? Y'all want to throw you for a real loop? Turn to Romans 14. This is going to really hurt. This is really going to dig in your brain. It's going to cause you to have to trust in God even more. If you was confused before now, if you spin around and not know what to do, this next one is going to get you. It's going to get you. 14 is going to get you. Romans 14, verse 23. Started everything and somebody shout that piece out. Reading it. Somebody. Okay. Everything that comes from does not come from faith is what? Uh oh. Now doesn't that like get right into your like like right in between your skin and the muscle? And just stick there like, ugh, what do I do with that? How, how many things? This is almost everything that is done without faith? Everything. Any and everything you do, whether you eat or you drink. Even a cup of water. Not drunk in faith. Oh, I mean, don't, but it's really is true. But don't get caught up. You understand what I'm saying? Don't get caught up with the, 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 like, don't get your brain wrapped around too tight other than to say, if you're doing anything in your life, if you're coming to P4CM, if you're going to small group class, if you're, if you're being friendly to, your, to a person at work, the faith that comes from, and what is faith? It takes three parts again. What are they? Knowledge, assent, and personal trust that produces action. So if your actions are driven by this faith, then you're okay. But anything that you do that's not coming from that place is sin. God is like, that's disgusting to me. He calls it filthy rags. He calls it a stench to his nostrils in his word. And when he says filthy rags, what he means, what that word means is like a woman's tampons in her time of the month after she used it and threw it in the trash. So to God, that's how your deeds look if you're not doing them in faith. But their sweet smell to his nostrils if they're done in faith. So the answer is, don't be scared to do nothing and stay at home, you know, with the covers over your head. The answer is, operate in faith. Understand who God is. Gain an appreciation for the sacrifice he made in the cross and operate in life in appreciation of that sacrifice in faith. And God's loving you every minute. He's loving you every minute. This is like a main, a main piece of the gospel, a main tenet. A tenet is like a, a, a principle or, or a main point of the gospel. It's different from many other faiths because they always say justification or faith and something else is what gets you to God. Some people will say justification or faith and baptism. If you don't get baptized, you don't know God. If you don't, if you're a J, a J dub and you don't go around walking two by two to other people's houses, they come to my house all the time. Well, actually, they kind of stop now because every time they come, I give it to them boys. I bring out the sword, boy, and I'm like, oh, really? Oh, so you read that verse, but wait a minute. Let's look at the concordance and read it in context. And how about a couple other verses that directly oppose these lies that you're telling people? <laughs> so I think they got, like a, they got like a list. They're like, don't go by 2619. Where's 42nd? That brother is reading his Bible, actually. And it's all bad. So anyway, they, they go around saying that faith or... Because or, they... Oh yeah, Christ died on the cross. But do you go around and, t and witness your faith? Do you speak in tongues? How long have you actually been at the church? Because if you haven't been here at least this long, surely you can't be a real Christian. That's what other, that's what other people try to do to twist things up. When anybody puts that stuff on you, man, like the Seventh-day Adventists, they might do that to you too. Yeah, brother, we believe too. But do you eat meat? Hmm. Do you observe the Sabbath? That's what other religions will do. They'll put stuff on you that God's not putting on you to make you to put a, a barrier between you and Christ. 
You, you think that's a bad thing? Look at in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Paul was pretty upset whenever people did this stuff to him or to anybody in his church. In Galatians chapter 1, he's, he's dealing with some people who, who get it twisted. They start thinking something besides the gospel is the gospel. Something added on to faith or justification is what it's really about. And in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And the gospel, y'all know, is that Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and we just talked about it here today. You know, you sin, born in the sin, life is sin. Christ came and his righteousness was imputed, imputed to us, and now we have righteousness in him by faith. Gospel. But they're believing a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Check out this brother. This is a bad brother right here. Y'all ever think about them stories in the Bible where an angel comes down and he's like just smashing stuff. Like they're destroying cities and, you know, like people talk about him in comedy, like lifting up cars. Stuff. I'm thinking, when I think of an angel, they're like, you know, like, like the rock, you know, the rest of WWF do the rock, or Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was young, you know, <laughs> or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But bigger and taller with wings, like really strong, you know. So imagine, this is Paul. He hears a different gospel and how he responds. And he says, but even if we, so he's saying, even if me, Paul, me, and my boys, even if us, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. In case you didn't get it the first time, in verse 9 he says, As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under what? God's curse. Don't let people put something other than the gospel that we know and love on you as your way to Christ and his righteousness. Because they ought to be under a curse. And I think this brother, he might have seen the angel or two in his time. They was probably floating around all in the, the zeros A.D. You know what I'm saying? One or, one or two of y'all got me on that one. But he said, man, if they come down from heaven, if I see the light of God shining on them and they talk about another gospel, though, they need to be under God's curse. That's a bad, I don't know about y'all, man, in the Bible that you read and how you feel about these things. But I think that's a bad brother right there. And he's pretty serious about what he's talking about. Because people will say that this sacrifice, there's something else up on that cross. There was something else there. Does anybody see any baptism on that cross? Does anybody see any tongues up on that cross? You know, it was a brother right next to him that, that was going to be with Christ in heaven that probably didn't spend too much time in between their conversation going door to door witnessing. Or getting baptized. Because it probably wasn't no water. Jesus got the one nasty sponge of, of probably old nasty wine. But I don't know what the other brother got anything. But people will say that this right here is not worthy. This sacrifice that Christ made and that he went through is not enough for you to, to, to see salvation. When Christ himself is not even saying that. Wouldn't you get offended if you were Christ hearing that stuff going on? But guess what? You have the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And I hope you are getting offended when you hear that type of stuff going on. Because that's another gospel altogether. When people add on justification and faith and anything else, when they start talking past anything else, particularly if you see them flipping from Old Testament to New Testament back and forth through scriptures, they're making up stuff. Y'all just making up stuff, is what I tell them. Because they don't appreciate or think about the first principles, which is the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And do we have to earn this thing? No. It was given to us freely by grace. Grace is God's unmerited or undeserved, this is a great definition, unmerited or undeserved divine assistance given to humans. Unmerited or undeserved divine assistance given to humans. And he gives us assistance for regeneration, for sanctification, for our justification. Right in the scripture that we're dealing with today, and back in Romans, Chapter 3, verse 24, you don't have to turn there. It says, And all are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And you may have heard the scripture, I told you guys, Ephesians 2, 2, 1 through 10, in verse 8, it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is a what of God? A gift. How many of y'all have to pay for a gift? 
sometimes when you get those, those uh, you know, who, them things you got to call up the people and go see. Sometimes you got to pay for the little gifts like shipping and handling. But this gift you ain't got to pay for. Amen. This gift right here is given freely by God's grace. It's given freely. And here's the, here's, here's the application piece for you guys. It gives you a few things. It gives you, uh, let's see, five things. This free gift. Here's what I feel. Freedom. If you've been locked up in the chains of legalism, one we had here, y'all know, was the fist bump. <laughs> if that was the only thing keeping you from sinning against God, you've got a problem. If that was what's preventing you from lusting against someone or having inordinate affections, that's a problem. There's freedom to be justified in Christ and have a friend who's the opposite sex, but conduct yourself in a healthy manner. Because you're given this free gift of justification by God's grace. You have confidence that comes from the gift of faith. The gift of grace, rather, through faith in Christ. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to have, like, man, am I saved or am I not? All you got to remember is that sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And this cross I put up here because it's empty. You know why that cross is empty? Because Jesus rose, man, and he's, he's ascended into heaven. And you can have confidence that he's right there interceding on your behalf in front of the Father. You don't have to have lack of confidence. You know, there's not different degrees. That same, those same people who sold indulgences, those indulgences raise your level of, 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 of holiness with God as if there were different levels. That's why even the Catholics have purgatory, which is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, but they have purgatory because even after you die, you can kind of like do a couple more good deeds and eventually earn your way into heaven. How scary would it be to not know where you stand with God? And this is the guy who created the universe. So you can have confidence, man, of, uh, of where you stand in the faith. There's also equality. There's nobody more special in the faith than any others as it relates to justification. Okay? Everyone is saved at the same level. Just because I'm standing up here and you're sitting down there doesn't mean we're, I'm more saved than you. Or because you've been saved for 25 years and I haven't doesn't mean that you're more saved than me. That justification is the same to all of us. So if you're young and someone's tripping on you, you know what I'm saying? Tell them, hey, there's equality in the salvation. My pastor said so. And he's just as saved as me. But there are observed differences in sanctification. Remember, the sanctification is like your personal trainer. If both me and you go to a personal trainer and we're trying to get better, whatever, let's say it's playing basketball, you'll probably be dunking in six weeks. I'll probably still be trying to grab the rim. Because some of you have better athletic gifts than me. So we may be, you may be able to observe that I can, I can uh, discern situations better. Or maybe someone can preach better. Or maybe like Chantel has a lot more uh, like discernment about situations that aren't very clear than I do. There are observed differences in our level of sanctification. But all that is is we're growing in, in that grace with God. That does not mean that there's a difference in us as it relates to justification. Y'all feel what I'm saying? So there's equality. There's equality. And that was a big thing too in the reformer times because the, 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 the Pope was super saved. You know what I'm saying? That cat was so saved he had to have a big hat to show it. <laughs> he had that special clothes, special saved clothes, you know. He graduated at different levels of salvation. Boom. I got the, you know, the extra special saved clothes. But there's no difference. There's equality in salvation. There's also hope. There's a hope that we have that in the, in the life to come, that we're going to spend an eternity with the Father. So we can put up with some crap right now, some difficult times, some challenges, because we have hope in the salvation that's ahead of us and the eternal life with the Father in heaven. And the last and most important thing, as I see it, that it gives us is power. There's a power that comes from the justification. Because I'm not trying to please you when I do what I do. I don't care what you think. I mean, I do, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I like people, so I care. But I'm ultimately not trying to please you. I'm trying to please God. And a little bit later in that chapter in Galatians 1, that's what Paul says. He's like, am, am I trying to please men? If I was trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. There's power that you can talk against the angels, man. Y'all remember the hub, on Schwarzenegger angels? He wasn't playing. He had that power. And there's power also to be humble to somebody. 
It takes a lot more strength, man, when you're right in a situation to humble yourself than it does to keep beating the other person down. And that power to do that doesn't come from yourself. It comes from the knowledge that you're justified before Christ. So I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if I just, you know what I'm saying, like, like uh, uh, you disrespected me. Okay, you disrespected me. I call myself, you know what, brother? Okay, amen. Hey, you got it, man. I, no problem here. And somebody looking on can be like, TQ, man, you a punk. I don't care about you, man. I got an audience of one. So it's power that comes from that. And it's justification. And that's, uh, that's the first brick or block of our, our strong foundation, y'all, is justification. We're made righteous in front of Christ, by, I mean in front of God, by Christ's work on the cross. It's a gift from God, not of works, so none of us can boast. Now, if you're in, uh, in this place, and, um, and you, 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 you've heard this concept of justification for the first time, and it's like, man, I saw that guy you had on the cross, and uh, I know I've lived my life in a way, because God gives us all a conscience. A conscience is just... God wrote the Ten Commandments on your heart. He already did it. He wrote them there so that you know when you're sinning against him. And all sin is, is we saw it's not anything not done in faith. He's also given some very clear, you know, if you've lied, if you've stolen, if you've, uh, um, if you've, if you've cheated before, if, you, if you've looked with lust, it's just the same as adultery in your heart. If you sin against God, even though he, justif he will justify you, if you've not ever approached Christ in faith to receive his grace, that, that, that salvation, that regeneration, that rapid change into something new, if you haven't approached Christ to receive that, if that's not making sense to you yet, but it's something that you know that you need, God's pulling at your heart. We're going to have an a, a aftercare team, if you guys can come over here right now. If you're that type of person, come talk to someone on the aftercare team. And I'll discuss with you the things you need to do. Because like I said, this sanctification is a process. And it, we, the, the body of Christ is one that's served in community, which means in groups. There are people that will help you understand the position that you're in and how to move from there to, where God, to what God has for you. And if you're also, you could be a person who is justified in front of Christ. You have been saved. But that part, you don't have anything to do with sanctification right now. When you first were saved, man, you were all about, how can I grow in the likeness of Christ? But for some reason, you just got off track. And God warned you, he disciplined you, he brought other people to you, but you didn't listen to him. And you faded away from whatever the salvation that God has called you to, into a backslidden state. They'll talk with you to get you back on the right track. God put us here for that reason. He brought you here for that reason. Or if you also just need prayer. Maybe your life is, is right as it relates to justification and, and, and your, your right standing with God. But you just need prayer. Like maybe it's a difficult time in your life right now. I, I don't, there's all sorts of things that are going on. You may have a government job and you're getting shut down. is going to mean who knows what to you. Or you work at a company that is affected by government funding and, and it's just a difficult time. You need some prayer about that. Um, the, the aftercare team will also pray with you. Uh, to help you be built up spiritually to continue to be able to deal with the things you have to deal with. Because just because we're saved doesn't mean we're all of a sudden, that's not magic. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it's a faith that requires perseverance. And we're here to pray with you to get you in, in that process. So, either one of those things, if you don't know Christ and you want to serve Him, you want to be saved, you want to be justified by Him, you want to have His righteousness imputed to your account because you're going to have to face God one day. You're going to have to face God one day. And when you do, remember your credit score is not high enough as it relates to righteousness. So see, so see them. Or if you're a person who's, who's backslidden, there's a point at which, they, they, like in Hebrews it talks about, if you keep trampling over the blood of Christ, if you keep on treating God, your righteousness, your salvation, like it's a cheap thing, there will be no sacrifice for you left. And God will snatch you or pull your car. So don't stay there. Don't stay there. Don't stay there comfortably because you're justified. Because there's grace, and Romans says, does that mean that sin should abound? Because grace abounds, should sin abound? So that means because there's a lot of grace from God, it means we can do all kinds of sin? No. God forbid. So if you're in that place, please uh, come talk to those people. Or if you just need prayer, please come talk to them.
Other than that, I'll pray. And then uh, if you, any of those three people, we can come see that. And then other than that, we'll see you guys next week for a talk about sanctification. That process that we go through. Step one to our how-to series uh, in, this, in this strong foundation. So please bow your heads with me.